Thank you, worship team. Appreciate you guys a lot. <clears throat> well, tomorrow we will celebrate Memorial Day, the day that uh, has actually been a holiday for a long time, but <clears throat> even before it was a national holiday, it was celebrated to remember um, uh, those that had fallen during the Civil War. And uh, of course, in the Civil War, you know, there's really no wins in the Civil War. Everybody loses. And um, good people were lost on both sides. And so as a way to recognize that loss and to forever place it in history, uh, then uh, the women would um, take these white, uh, kind of like a picnic blanket, kind of like, but they would make them from uh, linen or quilts or something, but it was just a solid white sheet and they would place it out at, near the cemetery and set the table and, and the people would eat dinner there together. The families would come, because uh, a lot of times, <clears throat> you know, in the Civil War, they the uh, army had not yet realized that um, you needed to put people in units for the, together that were from different places. Otherwise, you can have a whole town wiped out in one engagement. But during the Civil War, you know, people fought by state or by town, <coughs> by county. It was very common. And so a lot of times you would have you know, whole villages, whole towns of people Sorry, I keep saying village. I'm in Ukraine mode. We had our Ukraine meeting this last week, which is really exciting. I think we have 10 uh, from our church that are going uh, to Ukraine on a mission trip. I'm very excited about that. So when you hear me say village, you can just translate that into town, because I know we don't really say village a lot you know, here in the States. And so they would they would celebrate that time or recognize it. It wasn't really celebration in the sense of, you know, yay, hooray, but celebration in the sense of, of, of thankfulness for the lives that were lost and uh, and they would they would carry that tradition on each year um, actually and it wasn't usually on a Monday but then later on the, we, we made that a national tradition so that's where uh, our heritage is and so I, <clears throat> I want to start off with that because I think that there is a problem in our culture understanding Memorial Day and the significance of it I think or my opinion is what I see we what we do is we see it as a holiday we see it as a day to take a three-day weekend and we completely ignore or forget that there's a reason why that day uh, is set aside. And so uh, now as we celebrate Memorial Day, it's not just to remember those fallen in, in the Civil War, but in all of our wars and all of those times. And so I think it's good for us to ask, well, why is that significant? Why do we set a day aside to remember them? Why, why does that matter? Because we might, maybe on the surface, we might understand that and recognize that, but I don't think for most of us, especially if you're maybe 55 or 60 years of age or younger, I don't think you really or perhaps fully recognize the significance of those sacrifices and what they really mean. And why do I say that? Well, I say that because <clears throat> um, people in, in my generation, for example, we don't really understand what it means to uh, have ourselves or to be responsible for our own security, our own national security. We, we basically have our whole lives, we've woken up and it's been safe for the most part to travel, it's been safe to work, it's been safe to go to the grocery store. And so we just take that as, as kind of something maybe we deserve or should get because we're United States citizens. And what I think that we all need to recognize is, is that that is a great privilege. It is not only very little known in the world, because most countries don't have that type of security without us participating directly in it. You know, for example, the Soviet Union, <clears throat> they required everyone to serve, and in many countries have that same mandatory two-year or one-year a time where you go and you serve in the armed forces in some way, uh, and everybody did that. In cultures for thousands and thousands of years, the, the young men would go out at, at certain ages, and they would be trained as warriors, and they would defend their tribe, defend their village, defend their country, their nation, their empire. And so, really, we're an anomaly. Okay, an anomaly is something unusual that happens. It's unusual for us to not personally have to take responsibility for our own security. 
Now, if you have served in the armed forces, well, obviously, I'm not talking to you because you have taken some personal responsibility in that. And so, what does that mean? That we should all feel bad and, and we're all terrible people because we, we are taking advantage of that? By no means. But that's why we have this holiday, is so that we can recognize those of us who have not made uh, sacrifices for our own pers personal security. We can recognize those that have and particularly those that have died. And so they have basically given up the life that we have for us so that we might enjoy uh, a free uh, opportunity to thrive and live and experience what we might call the American dream. And so I think it's a problem that I want us to focus on today and to think about and, and to think about it in terms of our responsibility as believers. Because of course uh, our choice, our decision to follow Christ, to serve Him, goes uh, far beyond all of our other uh, responsibilities. And so it is from that that our worldview stems, that our thinking stems, that our way of engaging culture and life stems. So I think we have to look at that. <clears throat> and so we're going to look at the book of Joshua today. Uh, now before we do that, I want to uh, maybe dispel some misunderstanding uh, about the imminence of our situation. I think that many of you would be surprised to know that there are thousands if not millions of Muslims out there that would like to kill us all. That they would like to come through that door and kill you. <clears throat> and if you're, if you're unsure about that, I want you to watch the news, I want you to get on YouTube, and I want you to see them rallying in their mosques, carrying guns and, and shouting horrible, obsa um, obscene things that I cannot say to this afternoon of the ways that they would like to kill you. Now, are all Muslims like that? No. But many are, and they, they would like to destroy everything that we stand for as a nation. And so we have military forces that defend us regularly from that threat. So I want you to understand that it's a very real threat. It's not an imagined threat. If our military went away today, I guarantee you within a week you would be fighting for your life. And so we need to understand and recognize the significance of that. And that it ought to, that understanding ought to move you inside. It ought to cause you to realize that your life has been given value by another. And because of that, we have a responsibility with how we live. That we ought to honor those that have sacrificed for us by the way that we live our lives. So let's look at a military hero from the Old Testament, Joshua. Joshua was the son of Nun. He was uh, born into slavery in Egypt. I think we forget that sometimes because Moses, of course, is the, the leader that led the uh, Israelites out of slavery. <clears throat> but uh, Joshua, though he was a little bit younger, he was also a slave. And so he experienced all the miracles. He experienced the hardships that the Israelites went through. And then, of course, the 40 years wandering in the wilderness before they went into the Promised Land. And sometimes as we're, uh, you know, when we talk about the Bible and we kind of spiritualize things and so we, we think that we, we kind of maybe move it off into another category, not in reality. And what you have to understand is that, that the events that happened with the Israelites, those are very real events that very easily could have been you and me. We could have been born in that time and we could have experienced those hardships, those miracles, the excitement of, of God working, being the pillar of fire and, and all the things that happened, all the hardships that they endured to experience God's deliverance into the promised land. That could have easily been us. So it's not like we're just kind of hypothetically talking about these historical people. These are real events, real life that happened. And so because of that, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit allows us to draw uh, how we are to live and, and to draw strength and energy from those events. And so let's do that. If you have a Bible or, or some kind of device there where you can read that, let's, let's look at this first chapter in Joshua. I wish we could go through a lot. And last week I want to apologize because I kind of drove us through Nehemiah like they're like 90 miles an hour. And so hopefully you had a chance maybe to go back and read that a little more slowly. So we'll not try to tackle quite as much uh, this week, but there are, there are two words that I want you to look for. As we read uh, through this chapter, there are two words. You can probably guess what they are because of the slide that's up there. Uh, but strength 
and courage. Those are the words that we want to key in on today because those are the attributes that come from dealing with our adversary, whether that's in a military sense, uh, from abroad, uh, our adversaries in our life as we, we come against the enemy, as we, as we try to live out the Christian life. Uh, and so that, that can be manifest in many ways. And so we are to uh, have strength and courage. And we'll kind of define those more specifically later, but let's look. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to find it, and let's read together. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant... <clears throat> the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, who had served Moses. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness in Lebanon to the great Euphrates River, all the lands of the Hittites, and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you, just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. All right, now let's just stop right there for a minute. Okay, I want you to <clears throat> try to understand the overwhelming task that was at hand. First of all, Joshua was a military leader. Uh, he was trained as a soldier. He had endured hardship. Uh, through that time wandering the wilderness. He had experience leading men into battle. And so I think that's something we need to understand right off, that God chose a military leader in order for, for this time. Because I think sometimes we, it's easy for us to, well, we are all peacemakers, and the way of peace ought to be our ultimate goal. Sometimes to, to have peace, there, there is a difficult path that must be tread in order to get to that place. And so it doesn't just happen to us. Uh, and so this was a great task. This would be a little bit like, you know, there's probably about a hundred of us overall at Life's Journey. We don't all come at the same time, but if we were all just to show up on a Sunday, everybody, it would probably be about a hundred of us. And let's imagine that we all were going to set out to conquer Springfield. Okay, so there's a hundred of us. We, well, some of us are fairly well armed, but others of us not so much. And the city of Springfield, with all their police and, and Greene County Sheriff's Department, all that, it's pretty formidable territory, not to mention hundreds of thousands of them. Okay, that's a little bit like what it was for the people of Israel. All right? And remember, they had been slaves, so they'd been subjugated. They, they lived not a life of victory, not a life of strength and courage, but a life of defeat. And so now, all of a sudden, although many of those people had all been wiped or had died off during the, the, wilderness, the time in the wilderness, but now, out of that state comes this small army of people, although they were not too small in number, but considering the geographical region that was just described, I know not all of us were into geography, but that's a very large place. This was a very overwhelming task. <clears throat> and this is what got them into trouble before. This is what caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they lacked faith. They saw that it was overwhelming and they were just like, no way God, there's no possible way that, that that's going to happen. And God said, okay, you're going to wander in the wilderness while I teach you about faith. And so they'd gone through this, and here they are once again, the same place where they were 40 years ago. Many of us in this room are not even 40 years old, so you can't really maybe imagine or know what that is. Those of you that are older than 40, then you can imagine that time period. But a very long time period. And so what does God say straight off? Okay, and, ba and, and I think what really what's happening here is God saying, here's where you went wrong the first time. You lacked strength and you lacked courage. And so he says, be strong and courageous. All right, let's pick it up in verse 7. Above all, be strong and very courageous. Okay, so if, if they didn't quite get it the first time, here we are one verse later, 
And what's, what is being stated? Be, strong, be very strong and courageous <clears throat> to carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. All right, now what you should understand right there is that strength and courage being defined here in the Old Testament is a little bit different than what we might think of when we think of that. And that's where we're going to kind of maybe reorient ourselves a little bit so that we understand what true strength and true courage is. Do not turn from it to the right or the left so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you, here it is, be strong and courageous. All right, good job. You guys are just really excited, I can tell. You guys are just on the edge of your seats, you're pumped, you're ready to be strong and courageous <coughs> right after that, that Sunday afternoon nap. All right, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I'm getting over a sinus infection, so you may have to listen extra hard today. Verse 9, haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged. We talked about discouragement last week. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. <clears throat> All right, so that first section, that's kind of God's message of encouragement. All right, you, they probably weren't feeling real encouraged at the time, but that, that was the goal, was to encourage them, to cause them to embrace with strength and courage this mission that God had for them. Now we get into the second se section of this chapter where Joshua then prepares the people for what is about to come. Then Joshua commanded the, I'm uh, picking up in verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get provisions ready for yourselves. Okay, so remember that, get provisions ready. So they didn't just head off into the chaos, all right? They prepared, they got their provisions ready. <clears throat> For within three days you will be crossing the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you to inherit. Joshua said to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Remember what Moses, the Lord's servant, commanded you when he said, The Lord your God will give you rest, and he will give you this land. Your wives, young children, and livestock <coughs> may remain in the land Moses gave you on the side of the Jordan. But your fighting men must cross over in battle formation ahead of your brothers and help them until the Lord gives our brothers rest as he has given you. And they too possess the land the Lord your God is giving them. You may then return to the land of your inheritance and take possession of what Moses the Lord's servant gave you on the east side of the Jordan. And then they answer Joshua, everything you have commanded us we will do. Now that is a change. The first time, they were afraid. They said, no way. The people are, the te their technology is too great. There are too many in number. We can't do it. But this time, they said, we will obey you. This is in verse 17 now. Just as we obeyed Moses in everything, and may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. In the final verse, anyone who rebels against your order and does not obey your words in all that you command him will be put to death. Above all, be strong and courageous. courageous. All right, good job. Okay, so let's define these words then. Because I think maybe when we think of strong, we might think of physically strong, you know, able to lift a lot of weight, or maybe we might think of it in terms of willpower, maybe emotionally strong. But, but how does the Bible define that, and how ought to we define that? Well, first of all, obviously, <clears throat> I think the, the dictionary term, which isn't, or a definition which isn't particularly helpful, defines strength as the state, property, or quality of being strong. Okay, well, that's not particularly helpful for us. But if we dig a little bit deeper and we look at that word, particularly in the Hebrew, it means the following. It means, first, to resist attack or impregnability. That means, you know, not able to be so powerful, so strong, you, you're not really even attackable. Okay, that's one way it's defined. Two, to resist strain or stress or to be durable. Right? That's interesting. And then finally, to maintain a moral or intellectual position firmly. 
Huh. All right. So this is a little different than what the way we might define strength or the way our culture might define strength. So standing firm on a moral position, resisting strain or stress, in other words, being durable, being able to withstand a lot, and being having the power to resist attack. Now I want you to just think about that definition of strength for a minute and then apply it to your life. The, these are the things that we need as believers, as people that have been given a calling, all right? We're not just <clears throat> floating through life. We've not just gotten saved. The Lord's redeemed us and now we're just waiting around to die, okay? Which is unfortunately what we see in the church a lot, isn't it? We, we get saved, we get baptized, and now we're ready to die. Well, that's absurd. That is absolutely the most ridiculous thing I think I have ever heard. And so please do not believe that lie. Our mission begins at that point. At the point that we are saved and baptized, we begin and we operate and move out with strength and courage as we fight the enemy in this great battle. Jeff read a great set of verses there in Ephesians to, to help, I think, hopefully help us understand that we're not battling against all the physical things that we see only. But it's the spiritual realm, it's those forces of darkness, it's the enemy that fights against us that inspires all of our enemies who physically and literally want to kill us that we are to fight against, that we are to resist those attacks from, to be durable, to be strong. You know, to use if you're if any of those of you who are video gamers, <clears throat> if you are uh, strong, you know, in this sense, you you have what's called hit points. All right, and that means you can take all kinds of attacks multiple times and still not go down. Your character, your avatar, is still standing at the end of that, and so that's how we ought to be in life. That rather than become discouraged, like we talked about last week about battling discouragement, and we lay down and things aren't going our way, and we just want to kind of lay down and quit and die. By no means. We stand firm. We absorb those attacks. We let them bounce off of us because our strength doesn't come from eating protein and all that other stuff that might make us physically strong, but it comes from the Holy Spirit, which gives us true endurance. And so we have to be ready for that time. I mean, remember, they didn't just set out and start going. They prepared. And so we must prepare for this task. I mean, think about it. If, if you have to, to give a presentation at work or you've got a meeting with somebody and you've got to read their, their bio before you do that, you don't just show up and hope that it all works out. I mean, you prepare for it, right? Because you know you're going to lose your job if you're not ready. If you're a student and you have a test that's coming up or an exam of some type or a speech you've got to give, you prepare for that. So then why do we face real life, I mean not that those things aren't important, but when it comes right down to it, real life and death, the way we raise our children, the way that we conduct ourselves, why do we just get up and just kind of haphazardly go about our day rather than strengthening ourselves? with God's Spirit and with His power and with the tools that He's given us. And so we have to change this. We have to take that flippancy, that laziness, that, that problem that we have. Maybe it's just ignorance for some of us. We have to get rid of that and we have to get out of that and stand firm and, and to begin to be prepared for those things that are coming. Remember several weeks ago we talked about expecting hardship, expecting difficulty, that it's going to happen, that we can't just stick our head in the sand and think that it, and hope it doesn't happen to us. It's guaranteed we're going to experience hardship. We rebelled against God, we brought sin into the world, and as a result, it is going to damage us. We've already been damaged by it in some way. I mean, just the fact, the pure simple fact that we age and our body decays and eventually dies is plenty of evidence enough right there that there is decay, there is death, there is problems, that sin is at work against us. And so we have to, to stand strong. It's kind of like, for me, you know, I am a, <clears throat> I'm a late night person. So it is not difficult for me to stay up later. I don't have to work hard. Now some of you guys I know, you're just, you can just sit in your chair and go to sleep. And that's not a problem. That, that's like amazing. I would just love that. In fact, I'm getting ready to be on an airplane for like 12 hours tomorrow. And I would love to just sit on that airplane and go to sleep. I have no prayer of that happening. So you don't even have to pray for me for that. It's just not going to happen. Um, but I would love for that to happen. But um, 
in the morning time, when it's when the, my, my phone alarm goes off and it's time to get up and going, I could sleep forever, I think, at that time. I just cannot, I mean, I have to really pull it within myself, just like many of you, to stay up late at night. You just have to dig deep inside to drag your carcass out of bed. And, that, and so I'm a little bit more lean that direction. Now most days, you know, I don't have too much of a trouble with that because the way that my life works since the day I turned 16 and entered the, the, the real world of life and started working and, and all that kind of stuff, I just had to get up like most all of you. It happens. But it's a little bit like that battle that sometimes happens in our minds that we have to just decide it's time to stand up and go and be strong. All right, let's look at the second one of these uh, terms here, courage. Okay, what does it mean to have courage? Courage is defined as the state or quality of mind or spirit that enables one to face danger, fear, with self-possession, confidence, resolution, and bravery. Okay, that was kind of a mouthful, so let's read that again. Courage is defined as a state or quality of mind. Okay, so first it's how we think, right? So it's in here, in our minds, in our hearts. That enables us, that state enables us to face danger, fear, danger and fear with self-possession, confidence, resolution, and bravery. Okay, now resolution, if you're not as familiar with that term, term in this context, means that it, it comes from the word to be resolved, but it means you're determined. You, there's nothing going to stop you from accomplishing that task. Have you, ever, have you ever been determined, I mean really determined, I mean maybe it wasn't about a spiritual thing. You know, maybe you, you went to Best Buy one day and you saw something that you really wanted and you were determined to buy that and you were going to, to save up and do whatever it took, take a second job, whatever it was to buy that thing. All right. So for some of you ladies that's probably like, I don't know, Kohl's or you know, some place in the mall or I don't know, you know, that perfect outfit or ring or whatever, I don't know. You know, you fill in the blank, that signed football, you know, we all have that thing, you know, that red Mazda Miata. Uh, anyway, okay, so we're, we're determined though to do that and there's just almost nothing that is going to stop us. It's that type of resolve that we need to live our lives. And you know, I could say to live the Christian life. The problem is when I have to say that, that somehow it's like, oh, well, here's my real life, and then here's my Christian life. And so sometimes I'm going to live my real life. This is who I really am. And then sometimes I'm going to put on this pretend person that's a Christian, and I'm going to live like that. But you see, that is an illusion right there. All we have is our life. If we choose to conduct ourselves in a Christian manner, that's a choice that is part of our life. That's how we live our life. That should become our life. Now don't be confused. Does that mean that your life is always going to look Christian? Well, I tell you what, I'm pretty determined to follow Christ and my life doesn't always look Christian. So, but what that means though is that our heart, our mindset, our state of mind, to use our definition here, is so determined and so set that we're going to follow Christ and we're going to endure that no matter what happens. And that's how these, uh, these that follow Joshua in the Old Testament, that's how they were. They were determined. They said, we are going to obey you just as we obeyed Moses. All right? And it's not that they're, they're obeying Joshua necessarily. In other words, they're, they're obeying God because God appointed Joshua to lead them. And so as long as he doesn't stray from what God told him to do, they're following God through that earthly leader. And so they are determined as we ought to be determined. And so that's our solution, and that's where we need to kind of wrap it up today. That we need to decide, to make a decision to honor these that have given their life. Most of, well, almost all that we will never know them. We will never know these men and women that have died that paid the price for our freedom. We know Christ who paid the ultimate price for our eternal life and our freedom from sin. But we don't know these that have sacrificed for us. And so... What better way on Monday, instead of, and you know what, if you're going, I, I'm getting ready to go on a vacation, so if anybody is to blame for being a hypocrite, it's me. But as I go about and I enjoy that day off, 
I guarantee you that I will take time to pray and to thank the Lord and I will live my life in a way that would be honoring to those that have sacrificed theirs for mine. I will make a decision to do that. And I believe that all of us, well, all of us everywhere, but especially those of us that are believers, ought to do the same thing. To honor these. To honor these Israelites who died as they came into the Promised Land. I mean, can you imagine being a slave in Egypt, and then you go into the wilderness, you have kids, and your children go off, and they fight a great battle to go into the Promised Land and are killed and never experience that freedom. And yet many did. And, and so many of our uncles, aunts, grandparents, brothers, sisters, children have also sacrificed for us. And so we ought to honor them. I want to leave you with these verses before we pray. Exodus 15.2 says, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise Him. My Father's God and I will exalt Him. 2 Chronicles 15.7 says, But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Daniel 10.19 says, Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. Peace be strong now. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. Of course, that's the same Daniel from Daniel in the lion's den. And so as we always are at the end of any kind of challenge from God's Word, we're stuck with the dilemma of choice. We can choose to be conformed. We can choose to be transformed in our mind to be more like Him. Or we can choose to be either ignorant or stubborn and just keep on doing our own thing. And I think all of us, even if you're a child, you've lived long enough to know that whenever you ignore the counsel of those that are wiser than you, you often come to ruin. And yet God is the ultimate wise man. He is the ultimate general, the ultimate judge, the ultimate leader. He sees all things past, present, and future. And so how foolish would it be for us to hear His truths and yet walk away Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. God, I'm so thankful for for each person that is in this room with me today, Lord. I'm thankful for the fellowship that we can have. I'm thankful for the sacrifice that many of them have made to give up their afternoon to come to this place to worship you, to encourage me as I live my Christian life, that I might encourage them as they live theirs. God, would you place your hand on each one? Would you give all of us strength that we lack? Would you give each of us courage when we lack that? Lord, you've told us that you will give us the faith, that you will give us those things that that we lack, that if we lack wisdom, that we should ask. And so we come asking today as your children, those that will courageously follow you into battle, the battle of this life, through hardship, discouragement, pain, suffering, loss, through all of it, Lord. You have a plan for us. And not a plan to cause us death and sadness and sorrow and to leave us alone, but to prosper us to strengthen us, to give us courage and boldness, to build our character, though it hurts, that we might become more like you. So Lord, would you move in the heart of every man and every woman and every child in this place and every person listening, wherever you are. And God, would you give us the courage to stand up and live our life in a way that honors those that have sacrificed so much for us. God, I pray that you would work in our church where we've not just come out here just to do church, but to be a church and to seek those who are lost and hurting. Lord, would you help us to find those people? Would you 
free us from being so wrapped up in our own selfish lives that we can't see them hurting. We can't see them suffering. Lord, would you open our eyes? Would you lead us to them and lead them to us that we might fulfill your calling? Not just on us as a church, but on our lives personally. We just thank you and ask all of it in Jesus' name. Amen.